So I want to welcome everyone to uh, the Chemical Product Emissions Emerging as Urban VOCs um, uh, webinar session. And of course, we are uh, the Green Home Institute. Uh, we're a nonprofit, and our mission is to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the places we live. My name is Brett Little. I'm the program manager here, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, these sessions are approved for multiple continuing education units, AIBD, uh, through GBCI, BPI, as well as our certified green home professional under health and AIA, health, welfare, and safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. Um, I'm real excited to introduce our speakers today, who I'm going to hand it over to. Um, uh, first up, uh, we'll have uh, uh, Dr. Brian McDonald, who will be introduced by our first speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Matthew um, Coggin. So at this point, um, Matt, I am going to turn it over to you and please do take it away. Great, thanks, Brad. Um, hi everyone, my name is Matt Coggin. Um, I'm a research scientist at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I also am a research scientist at the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And um, I'm an atmospheric chemist. And so you're gonna learn a little bit about what we've been doing um, trying to understand uh, urban atmospheric chemistry, essentially trying to understand smog formation and how um, the uh, components coming from um, consumer products and industrial products can contribute to that. So essentially how emissions from the indoor environment can affect outdoor air. Um, Brian's gonna start us off, so I'll let Brian introduce himself while I get the uh, presentation ready. Yeah, and I'm a research scientist at the at NOAA as well. Uh, we're both located in Boulder, Colorado, and um, my expertise is on emissions, air quality, and climate. And so while we're waiting for the slides. Um, and yeah, I can see them. Yeah, so just before we get into this talk, uh, both Matt and I just want to acknowledge that we work with uh, a lot of other scientists in our laboratory to be able to make the measurements to to quantify impacts on the environment. And so just want to acknowledge our colleagues uh, uh, in this presentation. Next slide. And just to give a little bit of background of, of our laboratory, so we're in the Chemical Sciences Laboratory, which again is part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, we're located in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, our laboratory uh, does field measurements, at, makes atmospheric measurements, including of VOCs and greenhouse gases and other air pollutants uh, that are relevant to air quality and climate. Uh, we often make these measurements out in the field and we'll show examples of that uh, using aircraft, ship, mobile laboratories, uh, ground sites. Uh, and through this work, we work with uh, stakeholders, academic institutions, uh, other state and federal partners, including uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency. And ultimately our, our goal here is to, you know, collect the scientific data that can uh, better understand what's contributing to air pollution in the U.S. and provide that information to our stakeholders and partners to uh, enable or to support uh, uh, scientific decision making. Uh, next slide. And so, um, just to start, uh, some very basic atmospheric chemistry. Uh, and so, in the atmosphere, you have volatile organic compounds, uh, and these volatile organic compounds react with nitrogen oxides, uh, and these form a ground level ozone and fine particulate matter. So ozone and fine particulate matter are really the two main pollutants that contribute to uh, urban smog formation and, and really guide sort of, sometimes you may see this air quality index advising, you know, uh, to try and avoid uh, poor air quality. And so sources of volatile organic compounds or VOCs can come from both natural processes. So uh, vegetation also emits VOCs, uh, as well as human activities, uh, such as from combustion. And as we'll point out, 
from the buildings, uh, uh, from the VOCs that are emitted in buildings can also be a source to the outdoor atmosphere. Uh, and nitrogen oxides are, are, are mainly from human activities, especially combustion. But it's really the combination of the VOCs with the nitrogen oxides and the presence of sunlight that can contribute to smog formation. Next slide. And so on the left here, you just see sort of a classic image of, of smog in Los Angeles back in the, the mid 1940s. Uh, and, and, and it was identified uh, earlier on that motor vehicles are an uh, important source of, of VOCs that contribute to this, this photochemical smog. Uh, next. Uh, and so this is showing uh, measurements of VOCs in the Los Angeles atmosphere. So Los Angeles has been studied for a long time and has a very long historical record of, uh, of air pollutant measurements. And what this is showing is that there's been roughly a 7.5% decrease per year from 1960 to 2010 over, over in Los Angeles. Uh, and a lot of this big decrease in, in volatile organic compounds is attributed to uh, things like three-way catalytic converters that have been uh, installed on, on motor vehicles over, over many years. Uh, next slide. And so on the right here, just showing uh, present day or more present day Los Angeles and just pointing out that uh, urban ozone pollution uh, is roughly four times lower than it was in the 1960s. So clearly a lot of progress from, from uh, controlling sources of, of smog and air pollution uh, under the, the US Clean Air Act. But LA and many other US cities still uh, exceed national ambient air quality standards. And so that's kind of a question right now is, uh, um, where to, to go from here. So next slide. Uh, and so this is just an example of measurement, why we know that the, the VOCs and other air pollutants have been decreasing from the tailpipe of vehicles is because there have been researchers who've made repeated measurements over multiple decades as well on the roadside measuring the tailpipe of cars. This is just an example of these type of measurements that happen in Colorado. Actually, these measurements feed into the emissions inspection program. So if your car passes, uh, you know, driving by this roadside sensor, uh, sometimes you don't have to go and bring it into a smog test facility since your, your vehicle's been already tested uh, on the roadway. Uh, and so just the right just shows you know, big decreases in emission factors of hydrocarbons, which, which are also um, synonymous with volatile organic compounds. Next slide. Uh, and so this just really provides a context here for the work that we'll really be focusing on here is the emergence of uh, volatile organic compounds from what we've termed uh, volatile chemical products. So these are things like, everyday household products we might use, coatings, inks, adhesives, personal care products, uh, cleaning agents that we use. And a lot of these products are also used uh, in the built environment. Uh, next slide. Uh, and just to provide some context on VOCs in the indoor environment, this is a review of changes in indoor pollutants since the 1950s. Uh, and so some general trends you see are uh, the amount of uh, aromatic compounds, things like benzene, uh, have been decreasing in the indoor environment. Uh, this can be uh, attributed to reducing the use of aromatic or toxic air pollutants uh, in the formulation of, of chemical products, as well as decreases in outdoor uh, concentrations. Um, but there's also trends in the indoor environment that are moving in the other direction. So the increased use of uh, terpenoid compounds, and we'll go more into what these compounds are later on, um, but these are the type of VOCs that you expect to be in sort of pine oil-based cleaners or, or the scents and fragrances that are, are added to chemical products. Uh, next slide. 
and this is just an example of these chemical products. Uh, you know, uh, I mentioned that motor vehicles have been uh, uh, regulated and added uh, emission control technologies to them. Uh, but chemical products are also regulated as well for their uh, uh, VOC content and their uh, um, ability to, to form uh, ozone in the, in the atmosphere. And so just as an example, uh, paint is one, one type of chemical product that's actually been reformulated over time. And so, you know, if you go to the store, you can buy a solvent-borne formulation and a waterborne formulation, and the waterborne formulation tends to have less uh, VOCs in it. Uh, and so, uh, while you know the sales of of, of of paints and coatings has been roughly stable over time, because of the reformulation from solvent-borne to waterborne formulations, or the you know shift uh, of towards waterborne formulations, the, the overall emissions uh, uh, have been, been going down as well. But I think the point here is that, you know, the decreases on the motor vehicle side, seven and a half percent per year, which adds up to a lot over five decades, um, is, is, has been, so the motor vehicle emissions have come down so fast that even if there's decreases, in uh, VOC emissions from volatile chemical products is probably not as fast as what has been seen in the motor vehicle sector. Uh, next slide. And so in this presentation, uh, we'll talk about work we've done in Los Angeles to quantify the emissions from these volatile chemical products. Uh, we'll look at some measurements between the US and Europe, uh, uh, and then also show the impacts on ozone formation uh, in the New York City region. Next slide. And so just to give you a sense of how we uh, quantify these emissions, so we looked at, you know, where are organic compounds found uh, in the life cycle of the petrochemical industry? So we started by looking at uh, what is oil and natural gas used for? And not surprisingly, most of oil and natural gas is used for energy consumption. So natural gas, gasoline, diesel, this is used to power our buildings, industry, and transportation sector. And only roughly 6% of that oil and natural gas is used to make uh, chemical products. Next slide. And so just uh, the thing to follow is sort of these orange pieces. So these are organics that have the potential to get into the atmosphere. And so these uh, organics, chemical feedstocks, are then turned into chemical intermediates that are uh, able to make uh, solvents uh, and then also uh, plastic and rubber. Next slide. And then these resins and organic solvents are then put into chemical products. So as I mentioned, a lot of the, uh, the feedstock or half of the feedstock uh, is at least used for plastic and rubber, but the other uh, portion is used for these household products. So pesticides, coatings, cleaning uh, products, personal care products. Uh, and you know, in addition to organics, there's also water and other inorganics that are in these products. Uh, next slide. So what we also did was uh, not only look at the organic compound that is in, say, the chemical product that you might buy off the shelf, but also looked at the literature, including in the indoor environment, to estimate, well, if I use a, a cleaning product or a personal care product, what fraction of that has a potential to, to get into the atmosphere? And so we derived uh, VOC emission factors or the amount of VOC emitted per kilogram of a product that you use. And so I just want to draw your attention to the second to the left bar, which is uh, the VOC emission factor from a uh, motor vehicle. And so today, a motor vehicle emits about one gram of VOC per kilo kilogram of fuel burned. Uh, and then that's also a lot lower than um, this is on a logarithmic scale. So, um, you know, order of magnitude differences with uh, VOC emission factors in the past. Uh, and then I want to draw your attention to the, the right side, uh, the, the yellow bars. And so these are the emission factors from uh, chemical products. 
and a lot of them are about a hundred uh, over a hundred grams per kilogram of chemical product used. So the point here is that a very small amount of use of chemical product can actually lead to an outsized influence of VOC emissions to the atmosphere. And if you think about it, you know, the, v, the organics that are included in gasoline and diesel, their purpose is to be converted to energy. And ultimately, they'll be converted to carbon dioxide, uh, which um, also <laughs> has its own implications with respect to climate. Um, but the, the VOCs that are added to chemical products, they're designed to, to evaporate, right? You, you put a, a cleaner on a floor, you know, those organics are eventually going to evaporate into the indoor air and then get outside. Uh, next slide. And so we were able to combine these VOC emission factors with sort of this uh, mass or tracking of where organics are in the petrochemical industry to figure out how much the of uh, how much VOCs are emitted to the atmosphere. Uh, so next, so you know, there's a lot of VOCs that just come from the extraction of oil and natural gas. Uh, that's not the focus of this talk here, but. Uh, uh, our laboratory has done quite a bit of measurements with aircraft over oil and gas fields to be able to quantify these emissions. Uh, next. Uh, you know, you still have uh, VOCs that are emitted from the transportation sector. And there's also VOCs that are emitted uh, through small two-stroke type of engines such that might be used in uh, landscaping equipment as well. Um, but the, the main point of, of our study was to show that, you know, these chemical products uh, are also a, you know, roughly half of this total. Uh, next. Uh, and, and that was surprising given that only 6% of oil and natural gas is used uh, for, for these volatile chemical products. Uh, next slide. And so what we also did was looked at our emissions that we've quantified uh, through this uh, life cycle approach uh, uh, and also compared it with the uh, national emissions inventory that is uh, provided by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And one thing we noticed was that these emissions were being underestimated from these uh, volatile chemical products, so the orange and brown uh, pies here by a uh, factor of three. And so next we'll talk about, well, how do we have some confidence that uh, these emissions may be higher than, than we thought before? So next slide. So one of the things to be able to detect these uh, uh, emissions in the atmosphere is we need to know what type of VOCs are being emitted. And so um, uh, there's, you know, for, without going too much into organic chemistry, there's, uh, you know, the structure of the molecule can be, be uh, separated into these different groups. That's what's shown on the right. Uh, and uh, what's being shown here is the composition of, of VOCs. So on the left bars are the composition of VOCs in fossil fuels. And on the right are the composition of VOCs in chemical products. And what I just mainly want to draw your attention to is all this red. So all this red uh, that is in these chemical products are things like alcohols uh, that are often used in a lot of uh, in use in actually a variety of household products, um, but especially household uh, cleaners and, and also personal care products. Uh, and the only alcohol that's really found in uh, fossil fuels is uh, there's some fraction, 10% of, of gasoline fuel can be formulated with, with ethanol. Um, but, you know, the fractions of alcohols in, in chemical products often are way above this 10% threshold. So we can use these different types of VOCs to be able to detect these in the atmosphere and understand what sources are contributing VOCs uh, into the air. So next slide. And so in 2010, we made these measurements at the uh, uh, at Caltech. Uh, it was part of actually this larger field study that included a ship, aircraft, ground site measurements in Los Angeles called the California Nexus Study, or CalNex. Uh, our, our laboratory was the, the lead agency on this in partnership with uh, 
our, our state partners, including the California Air Resources Board. Uh, and so these measurements had an extensive suite of VOCs uh, that were state of art at the time. Um, and what that red box just shows is the footprint of that sampling site. And so it covers quite a bit of the Los Angeles basin, including downtown LA air transports to that, that Pasadena ground site at Caltech. Uh, next slide. And so what we did here was to create an idealized model of the, a box model of the atmosphere. So that, you know, outer box shows the conceptualization of, of you know, you have emissions and then there's wind outside and it'll dilute those emissions in the atmosphere. It also reacts in the presence of sunlight. Um, and, and so we have this outdoor uh, component to this box model. But what was novel in this study is uh, putting in this second component, which is the buildings and the indoor environment, recognizing that you know, a large fraction of these volatile chemical product emissions actually first get emitted indoors uh, rather than directly emitted uh, outdoors. And in the indoor environment, it'll dilute with a smaller uh, building volume than say like the volume of the outdoor atmosphere. And then also the concentration inside will be dictated by that uh, air exchange ratio. That's that lambda build. Um, it can also undergo, the, some of the VOCs actually can also undergo chemistry inside in the presence of, of ozone. Um, and the other thing we considered was there is some literature in the indoor environment of how much we expect to get into the air versus say, go down the drain uh, with use. So we took that into account as well. Next slide. And so uh, this is a little bit of a busy plot, but I'll guide you through it. So on the X axis is our uh, outdoor ambient measurements uh, of VOCs. Every marker represents a different type of VOC uh, that has a distinct molecular structure. So we can measure roughly 70 uh, to 80 different types of VOCs in the atmosphere. On the, on the Y axis is our, our idealized model of the outdoor atmosphere and if we only put in uh, fossil fuel emissions. And so if things are on this one-to-one -one line, uh, it means we can explain these VOCs with uh, uh, fossil fuel emissions. Um, but there's a lot of compounds that are a lot lower uh, than this one-to-one -one line. So uh, things like ethanol, acetone, isopropanol, uh, you know, we can only explain roughly 20% of the ethanol in the atmosphere from the emissions from gasoline. And so there must be another source of ethanol, acetone, isopropanol that is contributing to what we're measuring in the atmosphere. So we can only explain roughly half of the, of the mass of that we measure in the air with only fossil fuels. Um, next slide. Uh, and when we put in these volatile chemical product emissions based on sort of that life cycle of the petrochemical industry, we start getting pretty strong agreement with the observations. So again, ethanol, it's used in gasoline, but it's also used in a variety of, of household products. Acetone is added to a lot of coating related products. Isopropanol uh, obviously is in rubbing alcohol. And so we, again, making the point here is that we can use these individual VOCs and that tells us information on the, the, the different types of, the different sources of, of VOCs in the atmosphere, uh, especially between these fossil fuel sources and volatile chemical products. Next slide. And so the, the second piece we looked at was then measurements in the indoor environments. And so there's been measurements over, uh, you know, compiled in a literature review of thousands of buildings around the world, including in North America. And so what I'm showing here on the x-axis is the indoor concentration on the, and on the y-axis, the, the outdoor concentration. And the, and the point here is that the indoor concentration is roughly seven times higher than the outdoor concentration. So that's why all these points are, are shifted below this one-to-one this -one line. And what this means is that there must be indoor emission sources that are contributing to these VOC concentrations uh, indoors. And so next slide. 
And so what we did here was put the same emissions that we put into the outdoor uh, compartment and put that in our indoor uh, uh, component. And we were able to explain um, the, the concentrations indoors from these, these volatile chemical product emissions as well. Um, and uh, later we'll go into what some of these molecules are and some uh, further work we've done on quantifying this. But the bottom line here is that the emissions from these chemical products are important for explaining the indoor concentrations uh, that, that you know, we spend 90% of our times indoors, uh, as well as important to explaining the outdoor concentrations and outdoor chemistry as well. Uh, next slide. And so this is just to summarize in Los Angeles, this was for our estimate of 2010, that's corroborated by these atmospheric measurements that we have in the LA basin, but roughly half of the VOCs on the left are from these volatile chemical products and on the right side uh, from fossil fuel sources. Uh, next slide. And so here I've described the work that we've done in Los Angeles, but I'm now going to turn it over to Matt Coggin, who will talk about some of the work we've done to quantify these emissions in, in other cities and advancements we've made and be able to measure uh, more VOCs in the atmosphere. Thanks, Brian. So, yeah, you know, the, the, the key work of Brian from Brian's um, analysis of Los Angeles really opened up um, our eyes as to what um, what's contributing to the volatile organic compounds in urban air. But this leads to other questions about are these VCPs prevalent in other cities? Um, is this something that you would see in New York City or, or even smaller cities like Denver or Boulder where we're located? And then the other aspect is what molecules can we monitor to directly link to the emissions of VCPs? Um, so are there specific markers that tell us exactly how much of what we're seeing comes from, say, personal care products versus how much is coming from paints, adhesives, and all these other sources that we've been talking about. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work since that paper in 2018 to really quantify the fingerprint of volatile chemical products. And I'm going to um, start by using an example of, of how you can start to piece together what that fingerprint looks like. And so here, for example, is um, a antiperspirant that I use um, on a daily basis. And, you know, you can look at the ingredient list to try and get a sense of what molecules might be emitted specifically from an antiperspirant. One molecule that's commonly present in um, personal care products is this compound called cyclopentasiloxane, or what we refer to it as, as D5-siloxane. And this molecule is added to these formulations to give um, kind of a silky, smooth feeling to your products. Um, uh, it, it, it helps with application. Um, and so it's present at fairly high concentrations. And um, in the atmosphere, when you detect something like D5-siloxane, it's been shown previously that, that it's predominantly coming from um, personal care products. About 70% of this molecule comes from antiperspirants and about 20% comes from hair care products. Uh, there's another molecule that we'll talk about, or a set of molecules that are derived from fragrances. So um, fragrances are um, obviously added to personal care products or to cleaning products um, to, to make things smell good. They're also really good degreasing agents. Um, but typically when you see a fragrance or you see a cleaning agent, they're composed of monoterpenes. And there's two common monoterpenes that are, are used in these things, um, limonene, um, which comes from lemons and limes, and alpha-pinene, which is derived from pine trees. And um, we're interested in these types of molecules because, um, again, these are fingerprints for, for fragrant molecules in the atmosphere, um, but also they're typically derived, as you can imagine, from natural sources. So in the past, when we've um, gone out and made measurements in the atmosphere and we see monoterpenes, we typically associate them with natural sources because they are emitted by trees naturally in the environment. And so, for example, on the left, if you were to go to um, uh, a dense forest in the southeast, you can actually detect these molecules being emitted into the atmosphere at a rate of about 30 moles of carbon per square kilometer per hour. Right. So that's essentially just the flux telling you how much of this stuff is getting emitted if you're in a forest. Um, but if you dig into Brian's inventory um, in Los Angeles, you'd estimate that 
fragrant use from personal care products, from cleaning products, um, you could emit as much as 15 moles of carbon per square kilometer per hour in a place like Los Angeles. And what this means is that um, there could be a significant source of they're due to these um, volatile chemical products. And so what we're going to show you is that that um, is the case and um, is, is just proof that these, um, these indoor sources are really contributing to what we see in the outdoor environment. Um, first piece of evidence to show that we can detect these molecules specifically, and we can see the fingerprints of these um, of these volatile chemical products, came from our work in 2018 in Boulder, Colorado. Um, what I'm showing you here um, is just a summary slide of that work. But essentially, what we did is we measured with the with the newest technology that we had, uh, urban air for about a month or two uh, during the winter time. And what we observed um, is a clear, distinct pattern in the emissions of D5 siloxane, that molecule that I was talking about that comes from personal care products. The red trace here is a diurnal pattern, meaning you know, what is the emission rate of this molecule as a function of time of day um, shown on the x-axis. And what you find is that there's this um, peak of D5 siloxane in the morning, and then it slowly decays through the day. And what that's telling you is that people are applying this molecule in the morning when they get ready to go to work. And then it slowly evaporates from our skin throughout the course of the day. And you see lower and lower emissions as the day goes on. In gray, we're showing um, the emission rate of a molecule um, that typically comes from tailpipes, and that's benzene. And we typically think of benzene as being a great marker for, um, for tailpipes. And the big point that we want to show here is that um, the emission rate of D5 siloxane on a mass basis in the morning is equivalent to the amount of benzene that's coming out of tailpipes in a place like even Boulder, Colorado. And, and what that means is that, you know, in the morning, you know, there's as much D5 siloxane being emitted into the atmosphere as benzene coming from your car. And we've shown that this D5 siloxane comes from indoor environments. When we drive through Boulder, Colorado, for example, we see higher concentrations in really densely populated regions. Um, we also see it coming out of the cars for people driving around. So as you're driving your car, you're emitting this compound into the atmosphere. Um, and we can do a total emission estimate of, of D5 over the course of the entire day. So essentially, you just add up all the amount of D5 you're seeing over the course of the day. You add up how much benzene is being emitted over the course of the day. And you can see that they're comparable. Like even in a place like Boulder, Colorado, you can get about three to five kilograms per day of D5 siloxane emitted into the atmosphere from personal care product use. And for something like benzene, it's 15 kilograms per day. So this is again, just to illustrate that the emissions of these are significant, even in a small place like Boulder. So, you know, this was our, um, our first look at these kind of fingerprint molecules. And so we wanted to investigate this further. And to do that, we conducted a study called the New York Investigation of Consumer Emissions or NYICE. And this study is essentially an effort to measure these molecules in cities across the US. Um, we also partnered with, um, with uh, researchers in Europe to also understand how are these molecules being emitted in um, places outside of the US. And what we did to do that is we take some of our, um, our state-of-the-art instrumentations, we use um, what's called uh, a mass spectrometer, which can uh, measure the detailed fingerprint of VOCs from many different sources. Um, we also use canisters where we, we take a sample of air and we can transport it back to Boulder, Colorado, where we can analyze it for all the molecules that are in there. We put them onto a mobile laboratory and we drive through cities to try and measure these sources directly. And the point of, of this slide is to show you where we went, but also just to highlight that we can measure hundreds of volatile organic compounds. So essentially, you know, we can measure the fingerprint of all these different sources directly and can say with certainty how much of, of the VOCs that we measure in urban areas come from mobile sources versus volatile chemical products. And so I'm gonna start with just um, this molecule that we understand where it comes from, this D5 siloxane molecule coming from personal care products. Um, and I'm going to just show you the spatial distribution of this molecule um, in the United States. So on the bottom is essentially a map of the U.S. And the trace that's colored is where we drove with our mobile laboratory. The trace is colored and sized. The markers are colored and sized by the amount of D5 siloxane we measured as we drove throughout the U.S. 
on the back of it is um, a map of the U.S., but it's uh, it's colored by population density. So darker colors indicate more people per square kilometer. Um, and what you can see is that as we drive across the U.S., every time we get somewhere where there's a lot of people, we see more of D5-siloxane, right? So starting in Denver, you can see that it uh, D5-siloxane is, is relatively high. As we go into less populated areas, it decreases. And then when we get into Chicago, we see huge amounts of D5-siloxane. It decreases as we get into less populated areas. And then it increases significantly as we get into New York City. On the top, you can look at this more clearly by taking our data and you bin it by longitude. So essentially you're saying, how much D5 are we seeing um, in a few square kilometers? And what's the population density in that, um, in that region? And what I'm showing at the top here is then the concentration of D5 siloxane as you go across this, um, go across this graph or across this region. And then um, in blue is the population density in that region. And the point here is that there's a very nice correlation between these two proxies. So D5 siloxane, um, one is a good indication of how many people are around, but it's also showing that D5 siloxane, these personal care products are kind of everywhere. And they're in every major city that, that we sampled in, um, in the US. So we also see this in Europe. So um, same type of behavior. Um, if you look at um, um, cities, ranging from Germany to uh, Austria um, and, and um, further east. And what you see um, is the same type of trend. When you go into major cities, you see this increase in D5-siloxane, again, from the use of personal care products, um, that has a nice correlation with population density. Um, and so again, this isn't just something that we measure in the US, it's also something we see in Europe. Um, so now I'm going to zoom into New York City. Um, so what I showed you was kind of a general spatial profile of what D5-siloxane looks like and how we can use it to, to understand um, these personal care product emissions. Um, you know, I'm going to now focus on New York because this is also a region where we can understand how do these emissions impact air quality? How do these form smog and, and whatnot? So, um, Zooming in, uh, again, I'm showing you the same type of plot. Here we have um, population density um, across the uh, New York City region. And um, you'll notice, um, you know, in New Jersey, there's very low population density. Once you get into Manhattan, you know, 28,000 people per square kilometer. So that's a lot of people. <laughs> and then as you go over to, um, uh, to Long Island on the right, the population density starts to decrease. So if this is consistent with what we measured in um, across the US, we should see a ton of D5-siloxane when we drive through Manhattan where there are tons of people per square kilometer. And that is exactly what we see. So as we drive from New Jersey um, through um, Manhattan and then over to um, uh, Long Island, you see this gradient in D5-siloxane that generally matches the population density in the regions that we're, we're um, sampling. And again, this is just an indication of intense use of volatile chemical products, specifically from personal care products. I'm now going to show you that same type of plot where we bin the data by longitude so that you can see a cross-section of what this looks like. And again, you see the same type of trend. So in like New York City, you see that there's this big increase in population density shown by the, the blue trace. And you also start to see much higher concentrations of D5 as you go into these cities. And again, there's this very strong correlation, an R squared of 0.7, which is um, something you don't typically see in the atmosphere. These types of correlations are, are very good. So what this is showing is that, you know, we have intense personal care product usage. Now, you'll, you'll note that um, previously I talked about fragrances, right? You, and that's another molecule that we're really interested in. And that fragrances can um, are emit molecules that can come from both anthropogenic sources, but they, they can, those molecules can also come from biogenic sources. So from an atmospheric perspective, we wanna know, you know how much of what we see of fragrant use could be coming from, um, from an anthropogenic source. So I'm gonna now show you what does the spatial distribution of monoterpenes looks like? And do we actually see the signature of fragrances in a place like New York City? And so what I'm showing you now is um, 
uh, the concentration of those monoterpenes, limonene and alpha pinene. And what you see is when we drove through New York City, we saw this really strong correlation of monoterpene concentrations um, as a function of population density. Um, what you can't really gain from this in, from this map is just how the forests are distributed, right? So you have much higher concentration of trees and plants um, uh, in New Jersey and then Long Island, but you have almost, aside from Central Park, no trees or plants in, in New York City. But what you really see is that there's this correlation with population density, again, indicating that what we're seeing is anthropogenic. So these, these molecules that could come from either biogenic or anthropogenic sources in a place like New York City are really strongly influenced by the use of fragrances. Um, we can do something else to prove that these are coming from fragrances. We can actually look at the distribution of monoterpenes. So I told you that alpha pinene and limonene are two of the common um, uh, tracers for, for, um, uh, for VCPs. Um, and from fragrant VCPs. And the relative amounts of those tell you something about where those monoterpenes are coming from. And so what I'm showing you here is actually the distribution of all the monoterpenes we measure, alpha pinene, beta pinene, and limonene. And you can see that there's a difference. Um, so on the left, this is a pie chart of the monoterpenes that we measured in rural New Jersey. On the right is the monoterpenes that we measured in Long Island. And then in the center, these are the monoterpenes that we measured in downtown Manhattan. And you can see that there's a completely different fingerprint depending on where you are. So on the left, we have um, a monoterpene distribution that looks um, that is mostly dominated by alpha beta pinene. Same thing on the right when you're in Long Island. But in the center, we have, um, we have uh, limonene being the dominant monoterpene. And really, this is an indication of indoor air. So um, what I'm showing you here is the uh, monoterpene distribution from the previous slide in central New York City and Manhattan. On the bottom, this is what we measured outside of New York City in, um, in uh, New Jersey. On the right, this is what monoterpenes typically look like in the indoor environment. And this is from a review from Logan all in 2011. And at the bottom, this is a typical monoterpene distribution that you would see from pitch pine, which is the typical pine tree that you would observe in, in a place like New Jersey. And what you can see is that what we observe in New York City looks a lot like what you see in the indoor environment. Whereas when you're outside of New York City, that looks a lot like a biogenic source. Again, just proof and indication that what we're observing in New York City is really dominated from indoor sources due to fragrant use. Right? So just more proof about the signature of um, monoterpenes. Um, we can also try to now understand, okay, we, we know that what's um, being emitted in New York City from fragrant use is coming from these anthropogenic sources, coming from the use of fragrant volatile chemical products. Can we estimate how much? So, you know, we see the signature, but how much really is coming from anthropogenic sources? Um, what I'm showing you here, uh, again, is a longitudinal profile, kind of what I showed you previously in those maps. Um, of our observations in gray, um, showing the concentration of monoterpenes across the city. And then these blue traces are um, our model observations. So essentially what we can do is we can try to predict based off of models, you know, how much do the um, anthropogenic monoterpenes and the biogenic monot uh, monoterpenes contribute to our observations. Um, this dotted line uh, here is a model run where we only have sources from trees. So if we only put in emissions from trees, we cannot recreate the observations that you observe in Manhattan. It's not until you add in these, these emissions from volatile chemical products, these fragrances, that you can start to recreate the observations in Manhattan. And based off of these two different models, we can um, estimate how much did we have to put into the model to recreate the observations. And generally, we had to put in something like 70 moles of carbon per square kilometer per hour, right? And so um, that's a lot of monoterpenes. And if you compare that to the, to the number I told you about previously from biogenic sources, that was 30 moles of carbon per, per um, square kilometer per hour, um, that's double, right? So the amount of monoterpenes emitted from fragrances in Manhattan is, you know, significantly higher than what you would get from a, from a natural source. Again, an indication that there's intense use of volatile chemical products in a place like Manhattan. So 
what I've shown you and I hope I've convinced you is that we can use these, these molecules and these tracers to understand, you know, how much is present in the urban environment, where these things are coming from. Um, and it, this all suggests that there's a significant impact, all consistent with what Brian showed for Los Angeles. But now we want to understand how do these start to impact ozone pollution? That's the real um, next question is, yeah, these emissions are there, but do they actually form smog? And so while we were in New York City making these measurements, we were there during ozone events. So, you know, in the summertime, you typically get more ozone formation. That's because there's a lot of sunlight. It's really hot out. Air kind of doesn't move around. And so as many of us are familiar with, you'll start to see smog formed in, in major cities. It happens in Los Angeles, happens in New York City, happens here in Boulder, Colorado. Um, now, we focused, we, we essentially have, uh, we were there during the entire month of July, but what I'm going to show you um, are, are our estimates of ozone formation during really high episodes. So there was a period where ozone got as high as 100 ppb. That's much higher than what the EPA considers to be healthy. Um, that's the standard of 70 ppb of ozone. And so we're gonna try and understand how much of this ozone formed during this really high period came from volatile chemical products and how much came from, um, from cars, trucks, and fossil fuels. To do that, we use modeling techniques. Um, so uh, we use two techniques. One is a, uh, what we call a 3D chemical transport model. So um, this is a, a way to quantitatively assess ozone formation. Essentially, you can model air quality over the entire US and um, you could focus in on a small area like New York City to then really dig into how much of the ozone that you observe formed for, during these events um, come from different sources. We also use what's called a zero D box model, similar to what Brian described for, for Los Angeles. And this, this model is a lot simpler, but it allows us to, um, to identify precursors for ozone. So we can essentially take each of these different individual sources and we can do sensitivity analyses where we turn on and off different emission sources to quantify how much those sources contribute to ozone formation. And so we'll show you results from both of these different models. Um, first, uh, the, one of the key inputs into the model um, is emissions. And so what I'm showing you here, um, similar to what we had for Los Angeles, is that you, know, you need the emissions from volatile chemical products to recreate the, um, the emissions that were observed uh, in the New York City region. Um, kind of what Brian, similar to what Brian showed here, you have the observations of what we observed in New York City. This is then the, um, these are the numbers derived from the inventory. So how much you have to put into the model to, to initialize it with, with these VOCs. If you only had fossil fuels, um, similar to what you saw in Los Angeles, you can't recreate uh, a lot of the observations that you observe in New York City. It's not until you, you include those volatile chemical products that you start to see good agreement with the observations. Again, this is very similar to what we saw in Los Angeles, showing that with um, a proper accounting of all the volatile organic compounds with the inclusion of these indoor sources, you can start to recreate the observations. And I'm showing you this pie chart similar to what Brian showed for um, Los Angeles to show that in a place like New York City where you have a lot, a lot of people, um, per square kilometer, the VCPs are actually even more important um, and make up close to 60% uh, of the emissions. Um, the next thing is that I, I wanna highlight, highlight is that we also, again, have all these, these tracers for, um, for volatile chemical products. We have d 5 siloxane we have these fragrances. We also have um, these molecules that are indications of coatings. And the nice thing is that we now have really good observations of these molecules with these new state-of-the-art instruments. And essentially, we can recreate the, prof the atmospheric observations of these, of these molecules. So um, if you'd like to learn more about this, we have a, a number of papers describing these molecules. But essentially, you know, we can really start to identify each of these sources individually. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you how, how does this all contribute to ozone formation. So what I'm showing you here first is just a map um, of ozone formation during um, the, that really big uh, ozone heat wave that we saw in, um, or ozone during the heat wave we saw on July 2nd, 2018. This map just shows ozone concentrations. Um, and 
going from 55 ppb all the way up to about 120 ppb. Now remember the standard for healthy air is 70 ppb. And so you can see on this day that there was widespread ozone exceedances. You know, ozone got as high as 90 ppb throughout the New York City region. Just north of New York City, it got up to 120 ppb. And if you were to look at the air quality index, which is shown at the bottom here, I mean, that's very unhealthy um, air. And that was, uh, that exposed about 0.4 million people um, to unhealthy air during this heat wave event. And in general, overall, there was almost 25 million people were, were exposed to very unhealthy air. Like everywhere where there's red, there's 25 million people exposed to this unhealthy air. If we do sensitivity analyses, we, we've recreated ozone, we, we've we validated that, that our model is working well, we can start to do um, an assessment of how much of that ozone came from different sources. And so what we do is we turn on and off different sources. We can turn off mobile um, fossil fuel emissions, figure out how much ozone came from that sector. And then we can turn off these um, emissions from volatile chemical products, figure out how much ozone came from that sector. And when you do these analyses, what you find is that a lot of the ozone that we see downwind of New York City came from volatile chemical products. So of the amount of ozone formed from anthropogenic sources, about half of it came from um, volatile chemical products. The other half came from mobile source emissions. You might be asking, well, where's all that other ozone coming from? You know, that's that amounts for about 20 ppb, but you're saying that there's upwards of 120 ppb. Um, there's ozone that comes from upwind sources. That's that's another part of that pie. But then also, it's uh, ozone comes from biogenic sources too. Um, so a, a lot of that ozone is due to the reactions of nitrogen oxides and the compounds that come from trees. So, but if you look at from the anthrop anthropogenic side, um, a lot of the ozone is coming from volatile chemical products. The next thing we can do with our box model is try to assess okay, of this pie coming from volatile chemical products, how much is coming from different sectors. Um, so we can turn off and we can turn on and off the individual components of volatile chemical products and figure out how much of each of these sectors are contributing to that piece of the pie. And essentially it's a third evenly split between cleaning products, coatings and personal care products. And so, you know, these emissions, um, essentially all of these emissions contribute to ozone at about an equal amount. So that's generally the conclusions from, from what we learned in New York City. And um, I'm just going to kind of highlight, you know, overall what we learned. So the emissions from consumer and industrial products, you know, I hope we've convinced you are, are significantly contributing to the VOCs that we observe in New York cities. We've seen this in Los Angeles, um, New York City, and you can see this across the U.S. and even in European cities. Um, we've found that these emissions do contribute to ozone formation to a similar extent to the VOCs emitted from cars and trucks, right? So there's a lot of ozone that, that can be um, formed from these molecules. Um, and so understanding how that, you know, how that plays out in other cities is going to be really important. Um, and I think what we're trying to show here is that there is a connection between the indoor and outdoor environment. And so, you know, Brian showed that there's this exchange from the indoor environment that, that contributes to these outdoor um, emissions, and we really need to understand these exchanges better, you know, and so as we think about our building designs, um, and I was really encouraged and, and really excited to hear about some of these control technologies that might be available to, to minimize um, perhaps indoor air concentrations, you know, how does that also affect outdoor concentrations? And that's something that would be um, a really, you know, interesting area of research. Um, we do have next steps, so we're not done. Um, we've, we're doing more of these measurements. Um, we've just completed a campaign that we called SunVex, where we've, we drove through Los Angeles today in 2021 to understand how these emissions may have changed since um, 2010. We've also conducted, um, in the future, we're going to be conducting an aircraft campaign called Aroma, where we're going to fly uh, instrumentation on aircraft throughout many cities throughout the North America to try and understand um, you know, these sources, not only in Los Angeles and New York, but now Chicago, Toronto, Houston, and perhaps other, other cities in uh, North America. So lots more to come in the future. And, and uh, if you're interested, we have um, information about these projects on our websites. And I'll stop there. I realize we're out of time, but I'm happy to take questions or, or uh, discussion. Yeah, thank you so yeah, much. Thank you so much, Matt and Matt and Oh, it looks like oh, I'm like feeding back, feeding back something. something. Can you hear me all right? I can, yeah. 
There we go. All right, it went away. Yeah, thank you so much um, for doing this important work. And we got a lot of great questions. Uh, so let's, it sounds like you all can stick around for a little bit here to try to get to some of them. And before we get to those questions, real quick, those of you um, watching this in the future on demand, the recording, not right now, go ahead and head over to our Thinkific page or the USGBC channel. Take that quiz with an 80% passing rate and you'll be able to pick up your continuing education units. For those of you watching live, um, go ahead and check your spam in the coming days uh, for certs at gutenbergcerts.com. Make sure to take that survey that pops up to get your CU certificate. And as always, a huge thanks to our um, uh, board of directors, our new executive director, Jose Reina, our volunteers, and all of our sponsors who help us um, put these on and do what we do. So, you know, um, and, and just so you know, I, I, I don't see all out there anymore, but that's fine. Um, but uh, I just wanted to let you know that um, uh, there's a lot of questions coming in specific to uh, the sort of so what, um, and I don't know if maybe that's the next step or someone else is doing that, but it's really more of the, um, uh, the health impacts. And do you have any quick sense of, you know, what those could be? Obviously ozone is a clear issue. We understand that, but outside of the ozone aspect are, is there anything else you can speak to on, on what the health ramifications might be? Um, I could definitely answer that. Uh, so there's, there's this question also, you know, we focused on ozone. Um, but you all may be familiar with PM 2.5 as well. So that's particulate matters um, uh, with uh, sizes less than 2.5 microns. Um, that's also an, uh, a regulated pollutant by the EPA. Um, and one thing we didn't cover here is that these volatile chemical products also contribute significantly to PM 2.5. And so as these emissions react in the atmosphere, we get more PM 2.5 um, and and understanding that is, is something that we really need to understand. And PM 2.5 has been shown to um, uh, increase um, um, premature mortality. Um, it, there are some recent papers that show that um, solvent sectors um, can can be a really big contributor to, to uh, mortality. Um, ben Nault has a paper in um, atmospheric chemistry and physics on this. And so, so there's other pollutants, secondary pollutants that, that these, um, these chemical products can contribute to. Um, in terms of their um, toxicity, just as the molecules that are emitted from these, um, these sources, we, uh, we don't do any real work on the toxicity side, um, but uh, other folks do. And so there's definitely more work to be done in this, this um, realm. Um, and, uh, fortunately though, we can say that, you know, a lot of these products have been reformulated to be less toxic. So for example, reformulating a paint, you've taken out aromatics, which can cause cancer. Um, and you've supplemented it for, um, you know, water-based, um, products, which, which are, um, more benign, you know, and that's something that, that was, um, a big effort for, uh, consumer product regulations starting in the nineties. Um, so there is work you know, there has been work to make these less toxic. Um, I don't know, Brian, if you have any more insights on that, but you know, this is certainly work that, that folks have, are thinking about, especially in the indoor environment. Yeah, I think the only thing I'll add is, I mean, we, you know, the Clean Air Act exists, right? Because of, um, you know, concerns about ozone, PM, but other pollutants on um, their impacts on human health, right? Uh, and while we don't look at the toxicity uh, within NOAA, we work with our federal partners like US EPA that has uh, the expertise on toxicology. And ultimately we're just trying to provide the best scientific information um, so that you know, the standards that, that guide you know, what is unhealthy air, right? You know, so that you know, our partners have the, the information to be able to make sound decisions. Um, yeah, I mean, thinking about, um, the, the exposure to some of these things, and it sounds like right now, the biggest concern is, um, creating P PM 2.5 or aiding to uh, PM 2.5 and ozone. Um, but you know, how much of this is just sort of in the air outdoors and how much of it, you know, do you, do you think people are getting exposed to in these cities being outside? 
Um, you know, there's so there's there's work happening in the um, on these exposure estimates um, mm. from both an indoor and outdoor perspective. So we haven't done a lot of work or enough work really to understand the indoor environment. And mm. people do spend, you know, 80% of their time indoors mm. where the concentrations of these molecules are, you know, 10 times higher than, than what you observe in the outdoor environment. Mm. And so part of what, you know, um, is happening nowadays is, is trying to really understand that health impact starting from the indoor environment. So like the Sloan mm. Institute is funding a lot of research to understand the built environment and how these VOCs contribute to um, uh, exposures um, throughout the day, you know, whether you're indoors or outdoors. Um, mm -hmm. You know, our focus on the outdoor environment um, really is just showing the link between these two. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the information that we derive from our measurements um, informs something that really, you know, the EPA has cares a lot about the outdoor environment. Um, and and wants to you know um, reduce exposures of toxins like ozone and PM two point five, but with the work that we're that our colleagues are doing in the indoor environment, we should learn more about what those those exposures look like. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a good answer right now, but that work is is under um, is in progress and should you know I think in the next you know five to ten years should should provide better information about what these exposures look like in the indoor environment. Hmm. And I assume there's chance that, you know, it's being moved from one space and then being sucked into another. I mean, is that a potential as well? Yeah, absolutely. You, you know, or, or, um, you know, yeah, they go outdoors, they form ozone and then that ozone gets pulled back indoors. Sure, um, yeah. yeah hey. So there's, there's definitely this, um, this kind of feedback that we don't fully understand yet. That would be, um, a really, hmm really good to kind of understand. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I just want to make a point that the health-based standards, which got guide sort of the national ambient air quality standards under the, under the Clean Air Act are, are largely based on outdoor measurements, ambient measurements of the atmosphere, even though we spend 90% of our time indoors. And so, you know, I, I think I just want to reiterate a point that um, understanding the, you know, to some extent the the health standards, even though they're measuring outdoor air pollution, are sort of this integrated exposure, right, that we have whether we're inside or outside. And so yeah. elucidating more like, you know, what happens inside and outside and why we have health outcomes because of exposure to PM 2.5 and ozone, you know, it starts with understanding where the emissions are and what the concentrations are, right? We have a pretty robust network of outdoor air measurements but a similar type of monitoring network of indoor air doesn't doesn't exist other than, you know, researchers going here and there making uh, measurements um, in buildings, you know, when they can. Yeah, and everyone, please do stay tuned over the next few months, if not weeks, we will be doing um, some sessions on indoor air quality metrics and measuring and some strategies underway for that. So I just want to remind that everybody we will be diving into that um getting into some more specifics i didn't see formaldehyde on your list is that really not an issue that um of, of something that's going to be heading out outside anytime soon so formaldehyde um is is a bit complicated because it is directly emitted from mobile sources but it's also formed through the chemistry in the atmosphere mm -hmm. um so you know we are interested in formaldehyde and it's something that um we uh, were doing more work to understand, but also there are sources of formaldehyde indoors that um, you know can come from building materials, um, coming from the decay of wood, for example. Um, it's not there aren't really from there's not formaldehyde in vol volatile chemical products, so it's not something that we um, focused on in this study. Um, Brian, I don't know if you have more to say about that. Yeah, so I would just say, you know, there's other sources of emissions in the indoor environment, not just from household chemical products. Um, and so, you know, things like cooking emissions, building materials, um, you know, I think this is just a realization right now that, you know, trying to better understand what's being emitted indoors also tells us what's getting outdoors and, and you know, we're not 
we're trying to understand more, not just of chemical products, but also what other types of, of VOCs indoors um, matter. Mm. Um, what about, and then there was a very specific comment here in regards to dryer sheets and the, at least according to this, uh, uh, one of our attendees that they believe that the smell of that is contaminating the neighborhood. Um, have you seen anything like that? Or are there any chemicals of concern there? Um, so when we drive around in a, in a place like New York city, right, we can see all of these individual sources. We actually see, we see spikes of, of these things as we get closer or further away from, from um, individual sources. So we can start to see the fingerprints of, for example, like dryer sheets. We, you know, if we were downwind of a, of a laundromat, we would probably see those emissions and, and be able to characterize their profile. Um, we haven't done that. So we don't necessarily know exactly what comes from dryer sheets, but we do know that, you know, fragrances are part of that. Um, and uh, folks who've, who've done individual um, measurements of, um, of different components, so you can just sniff each of these things. You take your instruments and you just waft it in front of your instrument and you can kind of start looking at these, have tested what's in you know dryer sheets versus laundry detergent versus personal care products versus all of these various things and characterize those profiles. We haven't done that specifically, but what we've looked at really is the integration of all of those and how they contribute to things like fragrances. Um, so all we can say is that we, we measure fragrances in the atmosphere. Part of that is probably coming from dryer sheets, laundry detergents, but it's also coming from cleaning products and personal care products. Um, so we don't have a good answer just for that specific source, but um, you know, very likely it's, it's contributing to the observations that we see in an urban environment. Great. Um, what thoughts does this maybe mean from a, a, you know, a filtration or ventilation standpoint? I mean, it seems like, you know, we, we encourage people to ventilate their space, but they're then just moving it outdoors and now causing, you know, these, uh, PM 2.5 fog or PM 2.5 and, uh, uh, ozone events. Um, so, I mean, what, I mean, is, is this, leading to some suggestions for um, uh, filtration, even filtering things before they go outside, or, or, or what are your thoughts there? Um, so, I mean, increasing the ventilation mm -hmm. rate, right, would get some of these emissions outside more quickly, but I think at the end of the day, it's really just the mass that you use, right? Eventually it'll get into the air outside at some point mm -hmm. and so then the question is um, are there technologies to remove VOCs from the indoor air right before they they get outside um, I think there's you know this is where Matt mentioned there's a lot of work on the indoor environment to better mm -hmm. understand you know how does air exchange recirculation of air air conditioning affect um, the concentrations of VOCs that you see indoors. So one of the consequences is that, you know, by adding actually these oxygenated compounds, um, some researchers have shown, right, that they can actually, you know, once they go through the air conditioner, they may actually be removed, right, because they get condensed into water. Um, and so I think it's not clear right now what direction things go sort of, um, um, with these type of systems or how they're operated on the, the indoor VOC concentrations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I think, you know, more research would help to better understand uh, these processes and, and how they could be, be helpful. And in some ways you're, you know, we put essentially three-way catalytic converters or diesel particle filters are the filters on the tailpipe of a, of a automobile, right? It is their filtration system. Mm -hmm. um, might a similar type of, could you imagine the built environment, building environment to be, be similar? Yeah, yeah, good thoughts. Well, hey, we are about um, 15 minutes over. So um, Brian, Matt, I really appreciate your time. Uh, I learned a lot here and I hope everyone else did too. If uh, people wanted to reach out or review this study or learn more, 
where would um, where would be a good place for them to do that? So a good place might be to go to um, this website that we have at the bottom here, uh, slash project slash aroma. Um, you can learn a bit about what we're planning to do in the future. Um, but then there's also references to the work that we've been, um, we've really been uh, kind of working on since 2018, since that um, Los Angeles paper. Um, and, uh, you know, there's other resources on there that can help direct you to, um, uh, to learn more about the consequences of this work. So um, I definitely recommend starting there. Um, you could also go to our website for the SunVex campaign. It's kind of in the same general area. Um, Brian, do you have any other suggestions? Um, nope, I think, uh, Matt, um, you know, I, I think a lot of the references uh, are, are are also in the presentation, so. Yeah, yeah, great. Everyone, everyone has the, has the, has the uh, link to the handout there. So, um, Brian, Matt, I really appreciate your time again. Um, thank you for this good work that you're doing. We'll look forward to seeing what else comes out and uh, be safe and well out there. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.